2020, you're all very welcome. Thank you very much for coming out. And this, of course, is the meeting that replaced the December meeting to postpone because of the general election. So sorry about that, but you're all very welcome this evening. As I boringly said at the beginning of every meeting, it's your meeting, so you decide the case we move through and the questions that you want to ask. And it's your opportunity to participate in local decision making, to hold councillors and officers to account, uh, and to pass on your concerns, your comments, and your ideas. So, as usual, can we just begin? Can I just begin by asking councillors in the room to identify themselves? I'll uh, start with myself. So, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm James Holmes, and going down the Broadway, I represent the the left hand side. I didn't have to think about that. The left hand side to go down the Broadway Trinity Ward, and in no particular order. Can David? Uh, David Simpson, uh, Hillside Ward. Anthony. Oh, sorry, Anthony. Hillside Ward. Anthony and Simon. Anthony, back up down the road. Simon Ward. Anthony, back up down the road. Stephen, Anthony, Simon Ward. And as you know, Stephen is also the leader of the council, so, so he's here to listen to your opinions and ideas and comments tonight. So thank you already for being here. And the first, uh, the first up this evening is Paul McGarry, who's familiar to most of you from Paul is head of Future Merton, and he's going to brief us on the uh, latest developments with the town centre plan. Hello? Oh, hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. It's all quite close. Yeah. Um, good evening, I've uh, had the introduction already, thank you, Councillor. Um, tonight's meeting presentation, I'm not going to go through the whole council plan with you, it's too big for that. Um, first things first, the consultation of the final version is now live. It's on the website at Merton slash Future Wimbledon and runs till the 6th of March, so please go online. It's a big read. We did a couple of times, I saw a bit of the videos, but I'll show you a preview. Um, but tonight's briefing really is to I'll reiterate the purpose of the plan, why did the council uh, decide to do a massive plan for Wimbledon. The process so far, because let's face it, we've got to through a lot together. Um, the, the plan priorities, as they've now been refined in the, in the final version, uh, and then the, de the delivery of uh, outcomes from the plan. So just to refresh our memories, the plan covers the town centre, what you know is the commercial part of the town centre, so not the residential areas. I know this is a bit fuzzy on this huge screen, but it's clearer online. Um, but basically it goes from Wimbledon Hill Road, bottom of the hill really, along to the Broadway to the Leisure Centre in Merton Road, um, and covers um, set of Corpus Station and the tracks north and south of the station, including the double yards at the double tram stop. So broadly that's the town centre boundary in, in our local plan. So the purpose of the plan, so what place is that? So the purpose of the plan really is to establish a, a common vision for the future development of the town centre. And that was in response to concerns over the years that there wasn't a big picture or a big vision for development in Wimbledon. Of course, there's always been planning policies, but what do they mean, what do they look like, how they interpret it? Um, so there is in response to that, also in response to the peaceful nature of development. People felt that development just looked a bit random, didn't really look coordinated. So the plan really begins to put the big picture there. And the intention is it supplements merits existing planning policies. We haven't created new policies here. That will happen in the new local plan later this year. Um, but the diagram at the top there shows there's a, there is a hierarchy of planning policies already applicable in merits. So the top we get national planning policy with the London plan that sets the direction for growth of the whole of London, including Merit. And we get Merit's existing local plan. So the future of the master plan sits under them, that's the green band. And it just gives a bit more detail, a bit more depth to the existing policies and how the council will interpret them to make plan decisions. As a community, it gives you a flavour for how the town is going to develop over the next 20 years. And then, of course, after planning permission, we get planning benefits, we get community infrastructure levy, and what we want to do is invest in the public spaces in Wimbledon as a result of that development. So it's a quick pro quo. Yes, we're going to have development, but how do we get benefits for the town in the town? So we're not going to talk through all of this, um, but this actually describes the process we've been through and we're currently at the dark green bit at the end. So this all started from a conversation about ideas for Wimbledon in 2015. 
where the way a lot of ideas come from landowners, from the community and the representatives. And they kind of fail, those ideas were good, and they fail into two camps. The public spaces, the call bed streets, greenery, um, and also the buildings, the build quality and the architecture. We then hosted a series of workshops, 2017 I think, in here. And out of that, there were 10 key themes, the key theme workshops uh, for the building. Again, fit in between spaces and buildings, issues around public space, greening, the transport station, high quality architecture, retail, offer, etc. In the last version of this plan in last year, part of the feedback was the plan was too big, a bit too detailed, and 10 themes was a lot to take in for people. So in this latest version, which is out of consultation now, we've actually found a lot of overlap in those themes. So we've actually um, Draw it down to five priorities for women. And those priorities are public realm, more public space and better streets, urban green and sustainability. So that's whether that's refurbishing current buildings, going greener on new buildings, uh, the station and the railway. Crossrail 2 was a big part of this conversation quite early on. We know Crossrail 2 is still awaiting approval. But actually, this plan is not about how we deliver Crossrail 2, it is about how Crossrail 2 fits into our town. Uh, and then the buildings, there was um, a lot of, one of the priorities is design quality and urban design, and also the future of the high street. Retail is changing, um, restaurants are changing, and what we're finding is towns have to be more adaptable uh, and have more experience around them. So that's the, the five priorities for the building. And then the plan goes a framework for how we achieve that. So, in summary, uh, the document we can now find online simplifies 10 themes down to five priorities. In response to your feedback, we have emphasised the heritage assets in the, in the plan. We have brought this to buildings, we've got conservation areas, we've got historic parks and gardens. They were always there, but we've really emphasised that in the new plan. We've also reduced the building heights in certain parts of town. Previously, the, the, the other plan had about 18 to 20 storeys above the station. We've now taken that out completely. Um, and the biggest building would be 14 uh, above the tracks, and again that fits in with merits policies, but most of it's about six to eight storeys. We've also broken the plan up into phases. Part of the feedback we got from, from you last time is we showed the 2040 image. That would then follow up with the rebuild one row. Clearly that's not how the real one would work. So we've broken the plan into five year chunks, so you can see how well we gradually develop and where we anticipate the plan applications happen. Uh, we've beefed up the guidance on building quality and we've added in the 10 public spaces we plan to improve over the next 30 years. So, just to cover off briefly uh, the, the priorities for Wimbledon design quality. I mean, design quality is at the heart of what we try to achieve in the planning service. We know that better quality buildings and better quality public spaces make the town nicer, a better town for Jewish residents, a better town for people to do business in and for visitors. We do attract a lot of people here during the tennis. Wimbledon, what you think about Wimbledon and what you see in Wimbledon um, doesn't often match. So we really want to drive up design quality. Public realm came out of the workshops because there actually isn't a lot of public space in Wimbledon town centre. There's not a lot of spaces to sit down and relax. You'd be hard pushed to find a bench, to be honest. Um, so what we want to do is redefine our streets to be less traffic dominated, uh, better for cyclists, more space for pedestrians, because the town will grow, and with that, more, more pedestrians, more spaces needed. Under sustainability, uh, the council has obviously, with many other councils, decided the, the um, climate emergency. There's another work stream in the council dealing with all of that work, and we want a lot of residents to come with us on that journey. This plan doesn't create any new sustainability policies because it can't, but the council's new local plan and the work in the climate action group will over time develop that program. In terms of future of the high street as well, very important at the moment with the deadlines close, set of course got a lot of vacancies in it. It's quite obvious that shopping malls are probably on the way out. But innovative town centres are places that can be imagined that we can find ourselves. And going forward, what we need is buildings that are completely flexible and adaptable. Because none of us know what the high street would look like in five years. But if we build it to be 
right now of the bottom in 10 years. So we need really flights for the adaptable buildings. Uh, and finally, the station in the roadway. We have amended the plans for the station and the master plan. Um, we have not designed Crossrail stage, station for them, but what this plan suggests is how and when Crossrail is approved, how it should next into the building and fit in the building, to create that network of pedestrian routes across the station, uh, to deliver infrastructure, i.e. more bridges, and the desire for a town square. Uh, we've actually moved that in the master plan to be at the front of the station as the main entrance to the building effectively. That aspect of the plan is quite a long way off, but it is a 24 division. So moving on to the big picture, again I apologise that this is not as high definition as it should be as it is online. This is the kind of final version, if you were in a helicopter in 24, this is what we would look like. We deliberately coloured this not to look like reality, but if you can see the white and grey buildings, they're all existing, and they are mostly residential as well, and that's why we don't really anticipate much change. It's not like really planning growth. The brown and brick buildings, so for example, St George's Road, Walker Road, Parkville Road, uh, and Central Road Shopping Centre, that's where we anticipate a lot of the planning activity over the next 20 years. We know growth will happen. We know people will put planning applications in. The purpose of this is to guide those applications, make sure applicants know what we expect as a council or a community, and to give you the big picture of how Wimbledon might shape up. This is also going to show how the buildings fit together. We've not designed buildings, that's not our job at this stage. That happens at planning apps. So it is all a bit samey, a bit blocky at the moment because it's a model, it's not, it's not a blueprint. <coughs> So, I did mention we've broken that big picture plan up into five year chunks. So, currently, so the nice staff can wave you. I'll move you. So, this is where we pretty much as it is today. The best that are covered in is where we think development is going to happen in the next five years. And that's because there are already planned permissions there that haven't been built, or there are planning applications in but undecided or there's three application discussions with the council ongoing at the moment. So these are the areas we anticipate new development happening in the next five years. So again, Francis Grove and St George's Road. Uh, we've got the, the old Slug and Lettuce pub on Parker's Road, the rooftop cinema proposal above HMV, and over the next five years we've got the YMCA about to come in for planning and the council's car park next to the theatre. So that gives you a flavour as to what to expect in the, in the, in the upcoming years. Medium term, this just builds up on the previous picture. Uh, we anticipate set court will need to be reimagined and reinvested in. It hasn't changed in 27 years, but it's going to have to. So we're working with landowners here. We're nowhere near planning yet, but we anticipate that that investment is on the way. Uh, Morrison's Piazza stroke concert hall proposal is still under discussion. So that's the bottom end of Parkfield Road that you can see there. Uh, and again, St George's Road, we see the continuation of the build up. You'll also notice as well above the station we have put some new pedestrian bridges in. This, we want to use this as a lobbying document to network rail because we recognise with or without Crossrail 2, the station still needs investment. It's overcrowded at the front end, it needs interchange bridges across all the platforms, and we hope this shows network rail that they can don't wait for Crossrail, they can invest in the station now, and that will stand for when Crossrail comes along. So we want to use this as a lobbying document, design guidance, and a big picture for the town. Then finally, 2040, when I'm 60, um, we are looking at Crossrail Station being there, so an improvement to Wimbledon Station. Key change to this plan is we don't have buildings above the station anymore. That's where the tall buildings were in the previous plan, we took them out. Uh, we expect a bit of a build up on the back end of the centre court where it touches the tracks. And potentially, depending on network rail as a landowner, the lower yards we see still as a mixed use neighbourhood, but with a park at the heart of it. Uh, so that could be workspaces, offices, or residential. But it really steps down, we drop the building heights there, but it touches the current houses at the So it's bigger than all of this, it's smaller. So, so that's a kind of, it's a very cartoon picture. I don't expect you to absorb all of this in a five minute meeting. Please do go and read it online and form your views. Finally, 
yes, there's developments that actually want to secure improvements for Wimbledon because of that. And these are the 10 public spaces which have come out of the workshop, so these suggestions are coming from the community. And it's where we would like to spend some of the developers' money to give the council on better streets and spaces for yourselves. So if we're working from right to left, we've got the YMCA. They're proposing a new plaza as part of their new scheme at the east end of the Broadway. Wimbledon Theatre, uh, I've got an image later, but the council's delivering a new space there this year. Further up Wimbledon Hill at the other end, we've got money there to green the hill and improve the landscaping and sustainability and drainage of Wimbledon Hill. Uh, and then another space is our ideas and concepts at the moment to be worked out over the next 10, 15 years. For example, the town square at the station, the Donald Yards Park, St George's Road, Greening. We don't have all the detail yet, this is just a concept. The skipping idea concept uh, Queen's Roads. So if you stood at the Devon's side of Queen's Road now, we've got some beautiful historic buildings on that street, but every one of them turns its back to the street. It's the back end of a shop. And actually, it should be those shops should face the street. So we're talking to the landlords and said what about animate, reanimating Queen's Road. It already has white pavements, it already has trees, it just is a bit of love. Uh, but actually changing the character and nature of that can turn a dead street into a really nice part of town. And of course, if they have to invest in the mall, that happens back. Uh, probably just see the back of the mall. So Mark's Clay, just next door. Uh, this came through the workshops. This is a concept design. Currently it's a bit of a side road. Uh, it could be more for entertainment, sitting out, greening, park spaces and market stalls. We want to encourage small businesses and the fruit sellers there anyway, but actually why not a few more market stalls there. That would be a great space for people to hang out at lunchtime. Uh, and of course, during the web of the fortnight, that's a very busy space for people visiting. Space above the theatre. Um, apologies for the concrete blocks uh, that are there. They were necessary. Um, but we are currently designing this up for consultation in the next few months to deliver this public space this year. The intention here is we've got two roads and a big junction. We don't need it. Um, so we will keep the road access down the middle, but create much more pavement space each side, and that creates a much better spill-out space for the theatre, which is busy during shows. Uh, but actually, using natural materials in York stone and granite, we can actually enhance the setting of that listed building. It's gorgeous, but it just sits abandoned in a traffic island at the moment. So this is that we are looking to invest in that this year. Finally, um, we're going to switch over. There is a fly through video. It's quite quick. Um, I would recommend go online and watch it. But it starts off at Queen Road Debenhams and creates a street level view through Wimbledon. Obviously, none of the buildings are designed. It's a massive model to show the composition of all the building heights. It really shows that actually at street level you don't actually really see a lot of building heights. It's how the buildings touch the street, how it feels. So, this is to give you a 3D dummy view of the future of Wimbledon. So to the right, that would be the new Queen's Road shops and businesses. And then going ahead, that's the rooftop cinema proposal uh, on top of the curtain. And then up past Tesco and up onto Wimbledon Bridge. Very flashy crossrail station, but being highly ambitious here. And the new town square and planting. This is just past the Starbucks and then across the Argos Road and up Wimbledon Hill Road. And then turning into the St. Mark's Place. And that's us just facing the Ely's and uh, going probably the wrong way down Walker Road. And the intention here is to soften the street by introducing more street trees and landscaping. And then turn it down into Francis Grove and back around into St George's. So obviously these buildings will never be that colour or that blank. This is just no. Uh, and again, St George's Road is a very hostile environment at the moment. We want to soften that with more trees, more green, almost boulevard it. This is back into Station Square. A 
and then completely ignoring the one-way system <laughs> that we've done half the road. So some of these are already built, that's Pinnacle House, um, and the planning proposal opposite. And then we're getting into what would be the back of Morrison's at the moment. But we're also proposing new streets and laneways through that development. So this is turning into a new pedestrian laneway and public space, um, and it's part of the new Morrison's development. This lady, the pedestrian space leads you back into the castle. Just to give context, how high is that Morrison's building going to be? It's not in planning yet, but I think we're proposing six to eight. Six to eight? Yeah. From what to? Two at the moment, yeah? Four. Uh, so we're just going down the Broadway, uh, this is to the theatre, and you can see the live stage proposal just at the back there. And that's the, the new public realm vision. <coughs> So again, the orange ones are the you know, new buildings, if you like, the white ones are not touched. So it's a bit of a quick fly through. Uh, I would really would recommend going online, find, find a way around the town and look at the video. Really what, what we want, this final plan, we've been through a lot of engagement and got pain and tears and sweat. Um, so we're looking to run this for six weeks. Please respond on the council's website with an e-form and we're looking to get this, uh, take this to the council, full council, so all councils will vote on this. Um, depending on the timings, it'll either be April or May. Um, so, Great. Well, thanks. So, well, thanks very much. So as Paul said, it's important that you go online and comment. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, before this evening, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, just got a few general comments. First of all, yeah, I'll give a few general comments. First of all, just to give some context, I'm somebody that, I'm not a Londoner, I moved to Wimbledon 24 years ago, I think it is. I've lived in the same house in Dundonald for all that time. I'm not a fat cat, um, you know, millionaire who, you know, merchant council should be spending for more money to support the rest of the borough. I'm a normal person that's worked hard to buy a little terrace house. I actually love Wimbledon. I walk my dog in the park every day. I'm a volunteer in Wimbledon Library doing story time for kids. I do the pub quiz in the Alexandra every week. For me, the important thing about Wimbledon is community, and that seems to be missing from the master plan. It's all about attracting offices, businesses, people passing by like that, and it's, it's very short on community and residents, who, to be quite frank, bring a lot of money into Merton Council. Our council tax and our heavily increased parking charges and residence permits and parking permits, we're bringing a nice sum of money to Merton already. And I hate to say it, but that seems to be overlooked. And this is all about some aspirational turning Wimbledon. I can't remember, actually, if it was Mr. Anabritus or one of his friends, but a few years ago I went to a meeting where the aspiration expressed by a senior council member was that Wimbledon should be like Moorgate or Liverpool Street. And unfortunately, that does seem to be the emphasis, business space and big stations. That is not what Wimbledon is about. We're something different. We are a community area with lots of people wanting to bring their families up here. And that seems to be overlooked. As you say, you have referred to the little residential areas that are going to be unchanged, but you're wrong. They are going to be changed because the context they're sitting in is going to be transformed with many buildings being four times the height they are currently. So I would just like to make a few points. Don't get me wrong, I'm not against change. I realise that things have to change. It's clear that change is coming. The high street is suffering. To put the final nail in the coffin, to be quite honest. But change is coming, no doubt. But what I would say is that it's disappointing that this document is so high level, it does not have detail to hold developers to account. It's, it's strong on rhetoric and nice words like greening, but it's very short on firm promises and commitments or design requirements so that we can see that there really is going to be high design. And without being rude to Merton Council, the evidence that we've got around us, and you know this from the public consultations that you have done, most of the buildings that are most hated are buildings that Merton Council has allowed to be built in the last 10 to 20 years. So how can we trust the council to have high quality design without firm design requirements set out in this document? 
The other thing I would say is it looks as if you've talked about consultation. It looks as if it has been largely ignored. The overwhelming point of concern amongst local residents was building height. I would say, this is being generous, I would say the average building height currently is four storeys. And that's being generous because there are a lot that are two storeys. You are now proposing buildings up to 14 storeys high. Why not go for something a bit moderate? You know, a lot of people might be happy with a doubling to say eight storeys, but you're just having to be that bit too greedy. I have a, a colleague that is a surveyor. His job is looking at buildings and what the demand is for building space. He has told me that currently there is no market for high-rise office space. That is why there are a lot of hotels being built in Wimbledon currently. If you develop a hotel, you normally have somebody like Premier Inn who is committed to taking the building. Developing office space is, is speculative and high risk, and we already have empty office space in Wimbledon. Merton Council is also having a policy of building spaces without car parking. My understanding is that one of the reasons that Lidl's head office is moving out of Wimbledon is because of the lack of parking. So, you know, I just am concerned about the policies. So, can I stop you there, please? Yeah. I'm not sure the question was. Yeah, no, we were asked for questions or comments. These are comments. It's yeah. a lot to take in, actually. I'm not going to be able to answer any of that now. Um, and all I, my final point is, my, my starting point really, residents and stakeholders and huge funders of Merton Council, who do give a lot of support to, to Merton Council as a, as a whole, seem to have a little voice in the document. And it does seem to be all about Wimbledon as a commercial hub, something like Liverpool Street or Walgate, and not a residential community, which is what it's really all about. Four, four comments if he does. I, I would just like to make a couple of comments myself. This is the third or fourth time that Paul has been to see us, and, and, and you are all doing what I, what I would encourage all your neighbours to do as well, which is getting involved, coming here, giving your views, giving your opinions. Please do log on to the website, have a look, give the feedback. So, so Paul's job is to do exactly what he's done, which is to come to residents and to councillors with a set of proposals and a set of ideas. He is, the, the team are listening to what's being said because Paul this evening has highlighted changes that have come about as a result of feedback that he's received. So now everything you've said really, really important, and thank you for that, and Paul's listened to it, and the whole point of these meetings is so that councillors, elected members can listen to. So, so everything you've said has to be taken on board, has to be put into the process. If it's not, you should be back here at the next meeting saying, why did nobody consider it? But I, but I just have to also make a wider point before, before the next person <coughs> speaks, that, that please remember these are proposals that are going out to consultation. There's a lot of good stuff in here, but inevitably there are challenges as well. Uh, and, and Paul is here to hear what those are, but please don't underestimate the work that's gone into this. I, I've done all the time, but sensibly, the timing, I'm a little bit concerned. If the consultation closes in March, how have you got sensible time to genuinely review comments before you, you vote on it in the full council. Um, quickly, just on the two points. Of course, it's not Liverpool Street and Broadgate. We know that. Um, whether there is a special place, it does have good bits of character in it. It's got some awful bits of character as well. And that's where we see the growth happening. It is a commercial centre for the bits we're talking about in this plan. No one lives in St. Andrew Road. No one really lives in Hartfield Road at back in the cinema. Um, but a lot of this feedback did come from, I knew this would come at the last workshops, this is what the community told the council of what they like and don't like about Wimbledon, and that was public spaces and buildings, whether that be the architecture or the use. And it's so obvious, the historic buildings and conservation areas and listed buildings are green. People love them, and we're not looking to change them. The red bits, and the very red bits, is where we anticipate growth. It's where the office stock, as you just said, buildings up around 40 years ago, ugly as sin, we all know that. That's where we want reinvestment in better architecture, better quality. There is office demand in Wimbledon. I'm not going to argue out now, but there is. It is a growing town centre. Yes, it's a bigger station because we need a bigger station. It needs invested in. This is to guide investment decisions. It's not for us to design everything, but it's to give people a starting point, developers, I should say, a starting point for what we expect better to look like. Um, I mentioned the heritage earlier. All the heritage assets are there. The list of buildings, the conservation areas, the parks. The purple ones are actually not even listed, but we 
show them there is what character full architecture, the little grades. The white bits are the bits most people will like, and that's where we're proposing change. So in that respect, I don't think change is bad. Of course, it's a conversation about what good change looks like. That comes through each plan and app. We can't nail all down day one. So that is, a, that is an indication of the future, but it's certainly not a detailed plan. Okay, thank uh, you. Sorry, this is the consultation. This is the third consultation on this. We've been through a lot of iterations already. The point we're at now is this is the final plan. Unless there's something horribly inaccurate in it that we need to address as a council, it is about saying this is how the final plan we want to adopt this. Why is it third? So if this is final. <coughs> because we've been through two this years. Is this is the second we've been, one. Sorry, the second formal one. We've been through lots of workshops and one outside, workshop. outside this forum. That one been, workshop. No, there's not. And outside this forum, Martin had been to many very small resident groups and in conversations as well, as well as landowners and businesses. There's been a lot of talk about this. We think this pitch is Wimbledon at an appropriate level of growth, because if we ignore it, it'll happen anyway. And that's what we don't want, we want to control it. Okay, okay. 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 I'm going to move around the room so different people can speak. Well, I had indicated somebody else first, but go on. Just to clarify, you said this is the final plan. So I don't understand how... No, I'm going to answer that. It's not the final plan until it's approved by councillors. Councillors are here this evening to listen to what you've got to say. So, so please, continue doing, all of you, continue doing what you're doing, which is engaging, giving your comments, go online, have a look, feedback to councillors. We've been joined by more councillors who I might ask to introduce themselves in a moment, but that's the whole point of us being here. Andrew. It was just to echo the same question that Lady raised at work consultation. If this is the final, <coughs> you're taking it to council as many times that it, if the overwhelming feedback is we don't like this, we need to do X and X, it doesn't feel like a great deal of time to reflect that feedback from the consultation. And I take the point that you've been through a whole process with this. This is my first time seeing the final version of it. I haven't been part of all the workshops, etc. But more importantly, this is a vision for Wimbledon for 2040. How many young people who will be living in this area in years to come if they can afford a bloody room in it have you actually gone out and talked to face to face? The teenagers of our generation, not me. How many of you actually want to spoke to to talk about this and what they want to see their time would be like in 2040? Because most of us in this room, the greatest respect, will probably be dead by then, or like you, 60, and taking retirement. So it's out of time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. There is the problem about the question that most people don't hear it. Can't we have a roving mic? No, we should attach by the so, yeah. I'll, I'll, If any moment, so I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it. Is that still on? <laughs> sorry, uh, so, sorry, to clarify your point, it's a final draft. Sorry, not a final plan, a final draft for comments. Uh, I'm just quite right. Uh, I wasn't joking when I said I'm sticking to the time this is finished. Uh, the future of Ecuadorians, we need to get to know them better and understand them. Um, but have you? Not yet, we've only just launched this. On Friday. Oh, well, um, to, so this is the point because well, pre that previously, we did. Draft. previously we did. Um, but so, you don't seem to have really thought about the people who will be living in this space in 20 years' time, what their needs might be, what their needs might be. If you present it, you've got a council of a certain age and demographic, which will probably be dead by this time this is done as well, and you've shaped a future. For a generation you haven't really meaningfully consulted. Okay, it's a, it's a very fair question. Yeah. So, so in, in the previous version, we did do some engagement with local primary schools, not the level of this, it has to be pitched the, the right way. Um, do you want to say to you as a community, Andrew's right, we do need younger people's views on this, because it may well differ from other people's views. Um, everyone here, get your kids and get your grandkids to comment on this as well, that would be awesome. Okay, Thank great, you. thanks. Uh, yes. Um, I would like to say there is an alternative to this. There is an alternative to this. We launched a neighborhood planning group, a Wimbledon neighborhood planning group, last Saturday. Um, and it's, we are uh, aiming to produce a neighborhood plan for Wimbledon, which will have statutory backing. It will be in advance of this. In the pecking order. Um, but my, my question is really relates to what is being done for the residents. A question which you've already had. One of the real problems 
with Wimbledon County Centre is the traffic. Yeah. There is absolutely nothing done in that plan to reduce it. There are alternatives. This plan will actually stop some of the alternatives. One of them has been suggested by Wimbledon Society, and that is that you take traffic, instead of going up Parkfield Road onto the roadway, you take it further around. And by taking it further around, this plan will actually stop it. One possibility is to put a bridge across the railway line, behind the white building, and put all the traffic there, and then, instead of all the petty changes to the small spaces that we have in the you can have a much better public space in front of the station. Do away with cars there. This will actually stop some real progress. If this is implemented, it must be stopped. I'm not, I'm not objecting at this stage about the high buildings. I'm objecting about the inability to cure one of the biggest ills in Wimbledon, the traffic. This does nothing. It creates... More. Yeah. So I appreciate the presentation doesn't cover everything in the plan. There is a, a map version of this, the 2040 vision. It does include bridges or more bridges across the tracks to do as you suggested, alleviate Wimbledon Bridge, potentially pedestrianise it. So there's a bit of overlap with the Wimbledon <coughs> Society plan. Um, a lot of this is down to what we can deliver. Um, and so, for example, rail bridges, we want to move the portion to the network rail. I don't disagree with the ambition there about the traffic, uh, but principally this is to guide planning applications uh, the council to reach decisions on them. The problem with this, it stops the alternatives. It puts buildings in the way of where a road could alternatively go. So I'm happy to discuss that with you outside the meeting because we've not engaged as a council in the neighbourhood planning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If anybody yeah. interested in doing an alternative plan, join the new Wimbledon. Um, can I ask Kaz which ward do you live in? Just to see if you've got Dundon. So if you've got a council, you have, you have got councillors here this evening. So, so please raise what you've said, really important, please raise it with your councillors who introduced themselves at the beginning. That's fantastic news in the work on a neighbourhood plan, that's really, really good. And, and everything you've said this evening, raise it. That's, that's, that's why councillors introduced themselves at the beginning, because we are accountable to you. So, so, so they're sitting over there, grab them at the end. And, uh, and, and run through it with them. Right, next question. Are new bridges something that would be consulted on separately? Because I'm just concerned about diverting a problem to a different area, like moving traffic down by Dundonald School and Dundonald Park. And I can't, you know, you can shift the traffic and then just blight another area, as far as I'm concerned. No, so you've got to be really, really careful. You know? so when you, my, my question is, do you, when you consult on things like new bridges? Of course, yeah. The, they're so far down the line, when it's a reality, of course, the council consults on infrastructure, things like that. This plan's not proposing to move traffic from any part of town to another. Uh, any traffic schemes we consult on anyway. What we do know is, you can't really build your way out of traffic, but we do need to re realign public streets and spaces to better pedestrians and cyclists and green them. Uh, you just can't build your way out of traffic with roads and it's okay. really good. Thank you. But on the neighbourhood plan, there's a section in this document that diagram that shows how neighbourhood plan would fit the things so that that's any to Yeah, so um, to, to, to follow up on the gentleman's point, you did talk about um, less traffic domination and better for cyclists. But in the fly through, I didn't see any reallocation of road space. I didn't see anything for cyclists. I saw a few side people cycling, but there's nothing for cyclists. There, there was nothing that seemed to represent best practice in terms of. Uh, cycle lanes or anything of that, of that sort, and there were also big new wide islands which appeared to um, create pinch points. So, a lot, a lot of you know, I would say this is probably even worse for cyclists than it is now. So, can you speak to that and, and sort of give us some guidance as to what we can expect? Is, is, the, is the fly through representative of what we should expect? The fly through is not representative of the design of streets. It's indicative with the planting and things, but really it's a massive model for the composition of the buildings. So don't take the street design as red. Um, in the public space enhancements, we've indicated, and there's detailed natural document of, there's a one page of each of these in the document about the aspiration for streets, site, and space. 
The council process is when we get money and resources, we'll design it up properly and consult you guys, cycle and lobby, all of that, on actual detailed design proposals. We're not getting the detailed design for any of the highway works. We do that as and when we're able to do so. Um, but there's indications in here there. Don't take the fly through as a plan for the roads. It's more it's a it looked, the road looks far wider mm. than the roads I've walked down. It's mm. mm. uh, to scale and it's odd because when you're in the streets, you tend to see a widescreen. We do. Um, you don't often look up. So on the video, it does look stretched. But in reality, that's what it looks like. You can see a photo last. So it looks more horizontal than it really is. The video is an illustration. The way we're showing trees and things is about saying we'd like this street to be greener. The details of what trees, where we put them, all that will be designed and consulted at the time we're able to do that. But if the streets aren't wide enough, yeah, you can do it. It seems to me that the, how people get to the fountains is fundamental. Master plan, and I'm very surprised to, to see that missing. I mean, you, you, you. So, a lot of people come to the town centre for work, for example, with 15,000 jobs and a lot of them come by public transport anyway, because it's not 15,000 car parking spaces. Uh, the roads in Wimbledon are wide enough to be creative with, but there's a tension in all of that as it always is. We can put cycle lanes in, but that's the expense of car parking on the street. Um, we can widen pavements, but that's the expense of traffic lanes. And the council, like every council in the land, has to find an appropriate balance with the community of what gets. When, 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 when is that going to be done? It's not done in the master plan. Over the, so plan years, over the next 20 years. Over the next 20 years on that plan. Well, I, I, don't, I don't understand how you can plan a, a thorough wide cycle network, which is supposed to be you know, flat. I don't see how you can do that and not have the elements of that in, in these kind of masters. Because the other reason is we've established a vision for the future development of Wimbledon. We haven't detailed down everything for streets and spaces. That would be an epic plan, which we're not resourced to do. Okay, okay. Not, so so not, so not wrong wrong. Wrong. Other people want to speak. Yeah. Um, building heights, 14 floors. What's the meterage? Don't know. No, you need to know because you can't get us to, to comment on whether we agree with agree to 14 floors without actually knowing what that entails so to the, the actual scale yeah. of what we're, we're to expect. So the reason I said I don't know is if we put meter, meter limits on all the plots in Wimbledon, is that against the dating level, which is sea level, of course not, because we're on a hill. Um, so 30 metres in the Broadway and 30 metres on Wimbledon Hill are very different heights in terms of townscape. So what this does is, we've got a height problem on that, it shows the building heights in relation to the neighbours and in relation to each other. The other difficulty is, why we haven't been that specific, is floor to ceiling heights in different buildings of different uses vary. Residential floor to ceiling heights, about three metres. Office blocks, it can be four metres. So a six-storey building of residential would be shorter than a six-storey building of office. So what this, what the, and then plan, the building height map is in, in the document. Um, red is up to 14, yellow, sorry, orange is up to 10, yellow is up to 8, the blue and green are 4 to 6. It's all about how they sit next to each other in context, and that's how the council would, have, would look at planning applications anyway. Um, so, for example, there's a building on St George's Road. It's three storeys, and it's tiny um, because it's prefabricated versus office block next over to four storeys, which looks huge. So this is a guide, but we also ask applicants along their other policies about how it fits in the character, scale, rhythm, all of that comes into the mix. Don't, please don't think that built height is the only thing that matters in architecture, it's not. On the so ground, the guide, though, sorry the Paul, I will have to contradict because there are a, a plethora of applications currently which don't match anything you're saying. It, they're not characterful. The heights aren't proportionate. The um, you say you're protecting the heritage sites, but actually you're not taking it as part of a whole um, view. Yes, you're keeping them, but how is that relating to the new buildings that you're putting up? You're not doing it 
Uh, how is that addressing the climate emergency? Are you signing up to net zero carbon balance, for instance? What is Morantum Development, which is the, the council's own company? It's not a very good flagship, to be quite honest. You know, not one solar panel on four applications currently. So it doesn't matter Wimbledon or not. You are creating a master plan. You are creating a new a new future for a borough or for a ward in your borough and you need to lead by example. So all these lovely words are lovely, but the application on the ground currently is completely different to that. So I have certain <coughs> concerns. There are no design codes whatsoever. So this eclectic mishmash of whatever we've had that we complained about at the workshop, we did identify certain buildings and roads we didn't like. But it was to improve it and not to just whack it up with, you know, more very tall buildings that don't take into account the pedestrianisation of the, of the town, the cycle lanes, the greening of it in a way that is, is what we really need for, for this town. Um, I know you've worked very, very hard, so I'm not taking that away from you, but I don't think you've listened. You've not really listened. You've, you, you know, you've been tunnel visioned about we're going to put big blocks, we're going to put um, office blocks, we're going to we're going to go high, and we've made you a great favour by bringing it down from 16 to 14. Well, actually, it's not a big favour. You are not doing this town a, a favour at all with the kind of um, vision you have. Development. We're not against development. We're against. We are against this kind of development, which just looks at. Lego style, slip it in here, let's plonk it down. Um, Francis Grove, that was approved by you guys. You know, in terms of the pre application, it's not, it's not approved in planning, but in the pre application. Well, what are we talking about? If you're saying, oh, we're going to improve the quality, we're going to improve the design, when, it, when the application lands on your desk, you are pushing it forward in a particular direction. You look at their plan. They've got the whole of St. George's Road up by, you know, it's 44.5 metres currently. So you're talking, and it's 10 floors. You're talking 14 floors, okay, 14 storeys, double height or not. It, that could take it up to 60. See, this sorry, is not quite right for Wimbledon. There. There's a lot of me in that. There's a whole team at Future Merton. Future Merton. Future Merton. The development control team and future merchants, so, so, with so, particular so, so, one so, of your officers. So, your point, so, plan, so planning applications are dealt with by the development control team and, and yourself. By, advised by the policy my team creates. Ultimately, planning applications committed to sites, whether things are appropriate for the borough or not. So that's the planning application for its job. And they use the council's policies. This forms one part of the policies. But um, this policy is and, not agreed okay, through it yet. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. So, could you please let Paul answer? We're not personalising these meetings. No, we're we not, I'm not personalising. I'm, I, when I say you, now. I say Merton, future Merton. I apologise for that. Talking, then Paul can't answer. And okay. to give an example of the scale of growth, you just mentioned Francis Grove. Um, it's 10 storeys. The Virgin Active on Walker Road, with the flats above it, which was the old telephone exchange, that's eight storeys. We're talking about two-story difference. That is not, not an epic, in my view, not an epic scale. Of it's growth about growth 15 growth. metres difference, Paul. So, so, please, 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 so please. yes, my team do their job okay. to work with community and listen to you. It may not always be the same as doing what you want, but we have regards to what we're hearing within the confines of the plan and policy we work with and the government rules we work with. So we will never please everyone. We hope this is a good middle ground or the best we can get it. Um, but... Um, I can't comment on individual plan applications. Plan applications Fair depend enough. on the site what's appropriate. Yeah, but you can't say it's two storeys lower when it's actually about 15 metres higher. You can't. OK, he's, 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 he's answered. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm fine. 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 I'm and it was an overwhelming view that eight stories was the maximum we wanted. But you don't pay any attention to it. Why not? But we're meant to be the residents, the borough people, and you're meant to be people working for us, and not us <coughs> responding to your needs. And can I, that's fair, can I ask you what ward you're in, sir? Okay, good. So, 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 David, so, 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 so,
that building can be pulled down on the corner there with, with the Alexander Road and doubled in height pretty well. It's not on. So, that, so, so everything you've said is fair. So please, at the end of this meeting, speak to David, speak to Daniel. They're there as your representatives, and you need to have that conversation with them and ask, and ask them to convey your views, and, and then Paul, as the lead officer for this, has heard them too. I'll come back to people who've already spoken. Is there anybody who hasn't yet spoken who wants to speak again? Yes. Sorry, who wants to speak again? Um, yes, um, I'm here in Morris, um, and I'm here in Morris, and I know that I um, have been um, very involved in the last question. Could you hear me? Sorry. You know, I've been very involved in the master plan consultation since early 2016. At the, um, I think there were 2017 workshops, there was strong support for improving public spaces um, and amenities in the Georgia Town Centre. I appreciate the development of public spaces is probably not practical until the council becomes a truth of will eventually. But um, I am personally, I used to say over the years, Others are disappointed that more effort has not been put into new public spaces now um, and amenities like a leisure centre or concert hall or equipment. Um, the development of, of, of the small public space at um, our place and a small public space is not really giving you know, hardly anything to uh, life, enjoyable life in the Wimbledon Town Centre over the next you know, five, ten years. And, and I do think that more effort should be put into providing some square or green space, park, something that you know, would make the Wimbledon Town Centre more effective. Okay, thank you. So, so with, with your permission, if it's your meeting, what, what I'd like to suggest is that we hear from three more people who've already spoken that have indicated they'd like to speak again. Then I'm going to ask if any councillor wants to speak very briefly, may or may not. And then what I was going to suggest is that we do the next item in the open forum. So let's go into that too, which allows further comments on this, but it also allows other comments on other areas if you would like. Uh, and if you're able to stay for that bit, Paul would be very grateful. Are you happy? Well, I was actually going to, collect, I was going to collect final comments and then let Paul comment on, on everything rather than everyone, if that's okay. So, if everybody's happy with that, Madam White, if you, if you, if you haven't spoken, oh, you have spoken actually, go on. You cue barred, so that was my fault because Sorry. I forgot you spoke. Sorry. Just a quick question. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of talk about heritage assets. Uh, one of the few heritage assets in one of the um, backwards. And um, so, why on earth? Um, when it was a planning application um, accepted that virtually destroys the building. Okay, do you, do you, do you want to very briefly comment on green spaces and heritage sites? So, public spaces, um, I think they've got a point. There was a strong desire in the workshops we were at for a kind of town square, big public space. The issue with that is the space doesn't exist at the moment. So, to deliver something like a town square, the council would either have to buy a building and pull it down, or work in this plan looked to be the most obvious space for a town square would be, which is actually the the station. Um, I appreciate the frustration, there's not a big buying investment yet. This plan's about promoting incremental change, a small scale change, which is why we're looking at the theatre in St Mark's, because we can deliver that in the next couple of years. And we're delivering that with the money we get from developers. So it'd be great to do all this instantly, for the public space, we just don't have the resources to do that, so it is unfortunately incremental change. But I hope that's gives a flavour for it's not just one and two token spaces, there's actually a 20 year programme of sustained improvements there for streets and spaces as and when the opportunities arise. Okay, heritage, heritage. Heritage, um, so the heritage map there highlights the heritage assets in Wimbledon. Uh, you mentioned the bank buildings, they are. Checking <laughs> they're listed, both are listed. listed. That's gone through planning. As I understand, the main building is kept. I don't know the ins and outs of it all, probably as much as you do. Um, they're, well, they're going to demolish it the facade on two sides, they're only going to redevelop two thirds of the building. 
So as I understand, the reasons both are listed is insides, if it was more special, it would be statutory listed. I understand that's not the case. Uh, however, the Merit's Planning Committee and Conservation Officer will come to a conclusion on that. Uh, well, I think it's, it's, it's a hidden now issue, not necessarily a master plan issue. Well, it's just about protecting heritage assets, so are they all going to be destroyed before we actually get to it? Okay, so I'm going to ask for three brief comments and then, and then all to respond briefly to the three in mind. Um, comment on the buildings. I totally disagree with you that you don't know who's behind. I walk almost everywhere in the whole of Merton and I'm looking up a lot of the time at the buildings from a distance as I walk down the street. We need to be very aware of the climate, the local microclimate effect of poor buildings. The fly through shows how shady some of the streets are, which in a hot summer's day is fine, but in a cold winter's day, a lot of people who can't move very fast, ice staying on pavements. We need to think about all of these things. We need to think about in 2040, will we still be wanting high rise buildings? Will more people be working from home? Will there be a need for this office space? I don't know the answer. My biggest concern is the joining up of different departments in the council. So if you take, I'm, I'm very concerned that you guys, future Wimbledon, develop this fantastic master plan, but the design guidance scheme, and I've forgotten their name of that department, won't necessarily be going along with this. If you take the YMCA consultations as an example, they were guided by Merton's Council's design development team, or whatever they're called, to create a tall tower and some other buildings. And the second consultation, they changed it completely because of public opinion. They brought the heights down and they put joined up buildings. And I was told when I went to that consultation that the first consultation was the result of guidance from the Merton Council team. Okay. So I'm very concerned about joining up between you guys, the design advice team, planning, and the um, environment. Okay, great, thank up. you. Uh, I'm, I'm just conscious that we're nearly halfway through the evening, so heightened process. In a natural segue, one of the very first phrases you used in the presentation was high quality design, which is massively subjective. Mm. Council is in a position of leadership. It could set out a proper vision for good design in Wimbledon. To what extent does that plan do this? Because when you go on holiday to France, America, you instantly know that you're in France and in America by virtue of the design of the streets, the buildings, because they're very American, they're very French. You come to England, you step off the train in Wimbledon, and it's like the Heinz 57 varieties of architecture. It's awful. And you could drive change in that in 20 years' time by setting out some really good principles, concepts, and designs that aren't just quite height and massing, but what buildings should look like what they should be about, mm -hmm. and how they contribute to that sense of community that the lady behind us said, and the great phrase that you personally love to beat at us, placemaking. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. And final, final comment. Yeah, um, just a final point. And Paul, don't get me wrong, I feel sorry for you. You're in firing line all the time, and you're just trying to deliver what your, uh, your seniors want, which is high-rise Wimbledon, and that must be, it, you're always in the firing line, and I feel sorry for you. But my concern, I also have really, real concerns about transparency. This document also shows the very large number of documents where you're in pre-planning discussions with developers. The new hotel in Hartfield Road, the agent for the developer in its report that was made <coughs> before the public consultation said that they have been given a green light by Merton Council. Mm -hmm. It causes me real concern that there are all these discussions going on behind the scenes, which we are totally unaware of and we don't get the chance to comment. And to cap it all, Merton Council has now decided not to publish people's comments on the website. You feel free to disagree, but that doesn't smack to me of a council that is confident that it is doing the right thing for local residents, the local community, or being very transparent. And I think that is shocking in this day and age. Okay. Open justice and openness are key these days, and trying to do things on the quiet smacks of a council that doesn't really feel that it's doing the right thing by local residents. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, going to, I'm going to ask Paul to comment on uh, height, I've got my glasses on, height and process, vision and design, uh, but I'm also going to say to him, perhaps it's not your place to comment on transparency, but if you could comment on the rest. Yeah, maybe on mapping skill. Um, Yes, the, the height, you're right. There's way more other design issues than heights, microclimate, all of that. You're right. Uh, that's where the whole suite of planning policies come together. Uh, well, that's a similar YMCA, but the other lady said the same thing about the pre-act process. 
a lot of applications do happen, and council can't stop people coming to our door. Um, but we always advise developers to have a public consultation, and they have pre-application pre meetings with us. That's not always to say that the council supports the scheme. Sometimes we need the developer to go out there and hear you guys before the developer knows they need to change something. So the YMCA came on this terror scheme. I know my office didn't like it, but we needed the Y to be Y and hear from you guys to then force change to what we've now got. Because actually, you, community input in the pre-app stage with developers does help us get better solutions as well. So I, I don't agree that my team just said, yeah, crack on with that terror. We know. No, no, no. What I was told um, was they were guided into doing that. We get them in to do that consultation, and quite often that helps us get better results because we know the community feels. Paul, that's very reactive. So, Why are you so frightened of taking the lead and setting out what you want to see by way of application? So I'm going to set. I was going to come to that because I was trying to cover the minority. Um, so you mentioned about how you spent some varieties. Very good description of my mother over the years. And the document, it's not the presentation because I've tried to pick out the key things I knew were the big issues. There is a design architecture section in the document. What did come out quite helpfully for, from the, the previous forums is Wimbledon, we call it Wimbledon's DNA. You said about France looking like France. Wimbledon actually doesn't look like anything, it's like any little bit of London, to be fair. Um, the boarding terraces could be in Kensal Rise or here, it doesn't matter. Um, town Hall is lovely, station is nice, there's twin enrichment. So there's nothing utterly unique with Wimbledon. But the good, the old stuff is good. So we have picked out from that set of goodness what we'd like to start carry on. And we have picked out from the DNA the big civic buildings for White Port and Stone, the junior civic buildings like the banks, the library, the theatre, they're all red or terracotta. We want to reintroduce that. And actually, again, the community working with the council have achieved that at Wellington House. Francis Grove is picking that up to a point where it's extruded. Um, so to reinforce the character, we're kind of looking at the past, <coughs> but don't want to copy it because you can't copy the past that much. So we're beginning to get that character back in. It'll never be perfect, it'll never happen day one either. Uh, but the design quality section of the document tries to achieve what you're suggesting. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to come back to you in one minute because we're going to move on to the open forum and then I will come back to you first, I promise. Okay, it, it's the open forum. I was going to ask if I could just have Good, that okay, no, I will come straight back to you. So before we move on, thank you everybody for your contributions. Is there any councillor who wants to speak very briefly? Okay, great. So, so we'll move on now to the open forum. Um, so comments, you can continue your comments on this or you can widen it to other things. Paul has kindly agreed to stay to, because he's more likely to know the answers to other things than me. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's uh, start with you, madam, yes. Okay, thank you. So, going from the quality of life of people in Wimbledon, I want to talk about um, matters of life and death, really. Um, you may have seen this document. I think it's available at the entrance. You may have had it through your door. It's a, a consultation document put forward by local NHS bosses. And I just wanted to help make people aware that it's a fairly disingenuous document, in my opinion, because it talks about what they're offering you, and what they're offering you is the possibility of being able to borrow £511 million. It's not a gift. They have been given permission to borrow £511 million, and they want to spend it on a single acute facility. They make that fairly clear in this document. They don't make it clear that that one single acute facility that would be in one place comes at the cost of two major acute hospitals continuing to have acute facilities. So if we got this one single acute facility in one place, we would lose a and &E maternity, intensive care, children's care, emergency surgery, emergency medicine, coronary and cancer care from Epsom Hospital and St. Helena Hospital. So that would mean longer journey times for everybody in all emergency situations and in birth situations. It would mean in their plan they will have fewer beds, many fewer beds than they have now, and that's even if you accept their start numbers, which I'm not sure I do, but many fewer beds, between 50 and 205 fewer beds available to us in this community and as far as Epsom. 200, possibly 205 fewer beds. 
And it's very vague in their documentation, but when you look into it, what they're saying is they're counting as the number of beds they're going to keep. 200 beds actually provided, 100 in St George's and 100 in Croydon. I don't call that keeping beds in this area. That's saying that St George's has got to magically find probably 100 extra beds. I would say if St George's is capable of providing 100 extra beds, they would have done it for the patients near them. And to expect our residents to have to go to St George's and to believe that 100 extra beds will be found in St George's and 100 extra beds um, found in Croydon, I think is pie in the sky. I'm not urging you to respond to this consultation. NHS bosses are very keen that as many people as possible respond because they will count that to their advantage. What I am saying to people is read this document very carefully. It's not a gift, it's not an extra, it's a loss of A&E, maternity, children's service, intensive care, all those services in your two major acute hospitals. And, it, and what you get in return for that is a smaller unit further away, many fewer beds, many fewer consultants than you've got now. It's a loss, loss situation. Please do not accept it. Do not be fooled by this very disingenuous document. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, can I just say, if you want to know more, go to the Keep Us in Helio Hospital website or the Keep Us in Helio Hospital Facebook page. <coughs> there's film of the meetings, there's evidence there, and you can sign our petition to oppose this dangerous plan to downgrade two local hospitals and give the local trust even bigger debts to me, servicing this huge loan. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, who else wants to speak tonight? I want to... Oh, sorry, I'll come back to you next. Um, I just wanted to draw attention to an email I've just seen this last couple of days, that Merton Council is looking for uh, local residents groups and individual residents who have issues they wish to draw to the attention of the overview and scrutiny panels that the council run. So they're looking for suggestions of topics. Um, and it says, um, so the overview and scrutiny panels regularly carry out reviews of issues and services that affect people living in the borough. We are invited to suggest issues for them to look at this year. Ideas are not limited to council services and they'll consider any suggestions as long as they affect the people living in Burton. Past reviews have covered issues ranging from FEMA town centres, housing, recycling, road safety and children's mental health. And you can uh, you need to respond by the 13th of March if you have any suggestions for them. And you can find an online form at the Merton website www.merton.gov.uk forward slash scrutiny. So if anyone's got any suggestions what you want to scrutinise, please respond. What's okay, that panel that looked at the increase in um, car parking costs? Probably. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so go back. Go back like on the that. Tickers, or can they look at it again? So I would endorse what's been said. That's what those scrutiny panels are for. So if anybody here has an idea that you would like to be uh, looked at, then please do write and say that. Raise it with your councillors as well. And keep in mind, and we might not do it tonight, but keep in mind that we as a forum can also adopt a resolution which I then present on your behalf to a full council meeting. So we have that ability to. Can I just say, also, so you can fill out a form at your local library. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, this is my fault. All right, okay, go ahead. There's a question about Wimbledon Hill. Um, I was told uh, this morning that the local council had given a draft to landscape Wimbledon Hill. The draft was given three years ago, and nothing has happened. You know about that. Thank yeah. you. <clears throat> yeah. Is the priority you give to the draft? No, um, so th th that falls as in our public space design. The council didn't receive a grant. Uh, the council gave a grant out through community infrastructure levy. Um, so that's money we get from developers. Uh, there was a very good bid from Wera on Hillside uh, to agree on the hill. Um, part of the problem was there's a procurement issue because the bid came forward from somebody. What the council's green space team has to do is actually commission the plans and all that themselves. Um, so it has had a delay on that. 
uh, but it's not the case that the council got a grant and didn't use it. We have the money there to invest in the hill once the resources are there between the community and green spaces. It's probably taking a back seat because of the master plan work, but the money is there to be used. It's not going to be lost. Okay, thanks. Next, uh, comment, question? Yes. Uh, my question for Paul, really, it's a very simple one. What is the point of high-rise building? I mean, ecologically, they're bad. For the residents, locals, they're bad. For the traffic, I can't imagine what's going to happen when the Francis Grove, uh, I mean, if that road into the centre, we're going to have a gridlock for months. Where, where are the cars going to go? There's a GP search right there. And I, I, I just cannot understand. Is it purely commercial? So the rent of the offices is, is a big bonus for the council. Is that the reason to do it? So, so before, before I ask Paul to answer, I will, I will just say that, um, that of course, this, this bit of the meeting is really directed at the councillors for us to be responsible to you. I asked Paul if he wouldn't mind staying to help me out because I knew that there's a good chance he might know things that I don't from across the council. So Paul, if you're, if you're able to comment quickly, I'd be grateful, but, but, uh, but any councillor who wants to comment as well, that would be good. Yeah, so the question was, the building heights, why? Uh, yeah. We, we're not trying to propose them just for the hell of it. Um, but what we recognise is we're part of a growing city. London is growing. Every borough in London has to take its proportion of growth. So for Merton, we're building a lot of houses elsewhere. They're getting bigger too. Wimbledon is the main employment market for our borough. Um, the reason why we're promoting growth and we're promoting where, what we think is an appropriate level of building heights. You know, we're not got 40 stories. We're, we're talking 8 and 10 mostly, a couple of 14 is because the building stock in Wimbledon in the 60s, 70s and 80s office blocks, they cost money to renovate. So unless landowners can get a bit of value out of it, they want to invest in the building. Therefore, we're stuck with old architecture. So what this plan tries to do is show a level of growth that's enough to get the landowners and developers interested in investing in their building, giving us better architecture, but actually contributing to the streets and spaces as well. So we, have a, we, are, we are promoting growth, partially because we're a growing city, but we think it's to get enough money in to reinvest in those buildings. And we've seen that a couple of other office blocks, 80s office blocks, have been redeveloped already with two and three story extensions. It's enough to get things moving. So that's why we're, partially why we're promoting the physical growth of the buildings, but also we need more jobs and investment in the borrowers. Okay, thanks, Paul. Further questions? Hang on one moment. I think it's important that Paul explains the CIL levy to the group. Could you do that in a minute? Wait, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to have a, a quick word about uh, climate change and carbon emissions. Um, these are obviously massive issues uh, being dealt with at the uh, government level, and Merton is clearly doing a lot. Well, he's not clearly doing a lot, but he's clearly saying it. Um, and we will hold them to account as we go along. Um, <coughs> locally, I think there is a lot of work that can be done uh, among our communities where I think there is a huge lack of uh, fundamental knowledge about carbon emissions. Um, I think, in fact, probably children know more about this today than most of their parents. And I wondered whether the council could and should actually put out pamphlets and guidance uh, in relation to uh, carbon emissions and give guidance to the community about what action individual families and individuals can take to reduce the carbon emissions to acceptable levels and indeed what are the acceptable levels. Mm. Okay. Thank you for that. So, as you know, there's a national target, which, which uh, we as a country are going to move towards. But I haven't talked about Chris this evening, but uh, you all know Chris, and, and he's take, he takes down all these comments, and then what he actually does with them is each comment will go to the appropriate officer. So officers of the council who are dealing with that subject will get those comments, 
and then this evening you've had a, a, a load of councillors uh, take on board what you said. Well, but you, you were right what you said at the beginning, it is a central part of what's happening locally, uh, and it's, it's critical now for the whole country. Is there any comment, Paul? I mean, uh, is there anything else to add to that? No? Uh, climate change is also in future mirror. Uh, the Council's established a Climate Emergency Steering Group or Action Group. Um, there is information on the website, but the Council's committed to go in carbon neutral by 2030. There is a lot of information around the emissions from residents. I think a third of our emissions is about a couple of households, and another third by cars. So there's a lot of residents coming to but we're looking for community groups to join that action group and help the Council shape its actions. So I think there's a drag plan coming out around March. Great. Well, that's why that's why I asked Paul to stay. And while, while you're on the go, can you just do 10 seconds on SIL as well? Yeah. So let me mention SIL. SIL stands for Community Infrastructure Levy. It's a tax which every council applies to developments. So basically, every square metre that gets built, councils get a bit of money for it. And that gets reinvested in social infrastructure. So that can be parks, playgrounds, roads, uh, GPs, hospitals, schools, whatever the infrastructure needs are in an area. It's meant to mitigate the impact of developments. So that's why in, in the master plan we've said, yes, there'll be development, but we can use that still money to invest in street spaces, trees, etc. and Wimbledon. Does Thank the money you. have to be used in the immediate neighbourhood? No, so there used to be, no, it's far away, but what, Mer but what Mer Council does is we get a thing called the Neighbourhoods Fund. So that is more specific. So your ward councillors can suggest projects uh, for that funding. Um, so that's the local so. And the neighbourhood fund is for community projects, etc. Uh, does does Martin publish details of um, the sale funds that it's got and where they've been de generated and where the money's been spent? Yeah, so on the website, uh, if you search uh, spending the levy, um, on council's website, you'll find it. Brilliant. Okay. okay. The Thank you. on how we've realised that opportunity. By no means is that a done deal. Um, does it fit in the land? Is there funding? Etc. Etc. There are conversations going on, but I can't say that a whole lot of people. Thirty years ago, we've come to the biggest event of Jack Rivers in the So all I can say is there is a trust to have to talk to the council about whether they can acquire land, whether they can be funded, whether they can be built. <coughs> of course, it happens to the cultural offer would be awesome for Wimbledon, uh, but it's a commercial deal at the end of the day. So when is it the release on the Morrison's uh, car park runs out? The council kind of owns us there at least. I thought there was something... <coughs> well, Morrison's use it for car park, I don't know. Sorry, yeah, there's a covenant for the council to provide Morrison's car park into 2021 20, or two. Yeah, so I imagine Mount Council is having quite detailed uh, discussions with a number of parties if, if that's happening so soon. Um, and it would be really nice if there was transparency over what is happening with that as well. Because I can't believe that if that car park commitment expires next year, as soon as next year, there isn't some advanced thinking around that. So, as I said, part of the discussion in the future of that site is what's happening to the Council Group. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question for the European Council who at the back. I sent an email about 10 days ago about the uh, road work to South Wimbledon. Now, the new one in the Abbey Ward Council today section and I don't have responded to that. It's chaos there. We're choking on the air pollution that's being generated by the static traffic. 
Why have you not taken it seriously and why have you not responded? Mm. We have taken it seriously. Officers have responded to, I believe. Uh, yeah, but not the council. To, 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 to the local council. I've seen the responses. Leah Cooper, Steve Cooper, I've seen some of the actions that have been taken. We'll continue to, to, uh, to review it to make sure that traffic is flows as quickly as possible. These roadworks are essential, I believe, but uh, we appreciate it. I saw you in the my office to respond to this one. Why did you not come out on site visit with the rest of someone there? Why did I not come out on site visit with the rest of someone there? I was I didn't see the invitation. You said you'd seen the email. You must have been in your office and arrived on site. I did I did not see the invitation. But you but you must have been in your office and arrived on site. Well I, it doesn't whether I whether I turned up last week I can come this week. I Okay, I'm going to let you guys continue as well. Next question or comment? A minimum, but we can't stop congestion uh, uh, works to improve the roads. Questions or comments? Okay. With right, yes. all this new building development and the current climate crisis that we all, we all know about, you know, this is a very good opportunity. Instigate or to encourage developers to incorporate environmentally friendly yeah. uh, yeah, detail it, or into the buildings, you know, properties into the buildings. I, I think you said solar panels is a principle or solar panels. Or, uh, I think we could make that uh, a requirement as part of the planning, uh, at, you know, the planning process. You know, that you could stipulate. You're in a position to do that. These, these developers need encouragement and even arm twisting. Is that right? Can you, can you make a stipulation? So the, the council has policies on sustainability. Uh, a lot of it's now sitting in building regulations, which isn't a planning function. Uh, but I think you're right, a lot of the policy movement is heading in that direction. The council's policy really is not just to jump to putting bits of kit on a building, uh, we promote a fabric first approach, so the more insulation you've got in a building, the less heat and energy you should need in the first place. So we always look to a better building quality and building fabric, air tightness, glazing, etc. And then if you need to generate electricity on site, it could be done either that way, by putting things on site if it's feasible. Wind turbines aren't always feasible, solar panels aren't always feasible, or if you mean carbon reductions through the building itself, you don't need to put bits of kit everywhere. So there's a whole mishmash of ways of dealing with carbon neutrality. But I think your point there is, can policies go further? Uh, yes, I think that's the direction of travel. The master plan doesn't deal with it, Mayor's local plan, and national building rates will be going that direction, I guess. Okay. Um, yes, ma'am? Um, just to feed into the pollution problem, apparently, I'm going back to the health service, apparently 10% of journeys in the area are related to health journeys. If we are uh, moved to a single acute facility, that will mean longer journeys, more travel, more pollution. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or questions? Any other questions or questions? Um, you'll be the last one again, I think. Yeah. yeah, just a question. I mean, uh, the man who seems to be putting a lot of emphasis on a superstation in Wimbledon and, uh, you know, says it's really committed to transport. So is it really not possible for... Uh, the proposals of Wimbledon Chase Station to include step-free access instead of focusing on another, yet another ugly, high-rise, bulky development like the absolutely appalling uh, development on the site of the Lady Emma in Wimbledon Park, which I think is an absolute disgrace. There was real, I mean, uh, let, let me give credit where credit's due. I think what Merton Council achieved with the Nelson Hospital is actually one of its few positive, so mm -hmm. as far as as local residents, I think they achieved something very good there, mm -hmm. um, and it was better than I expected. And there was real scope to continue that trend and, and um, really improve um, the Wimbledon Chase area, and instead it's being blighted by this cheap, ugly, bulky design with, again, no real thought for the people that are living in some lovely conservation streets, they're just being blighted by this cheap and ugly, bulky design. And also, not even enhancing the station. I think it's a disgrace. Yeah. So, um,
So we've got, yes. Just a quick one. Um, we're going to please everybody in the development. I, I just wondered how many people here are broadly in favour of the plan that has been put forward. Wimbledon Chair. No, it's Wimbledon. Oh, Wimbledon. We haven't read it all yet. Yeah. Hmm? We haven't all read it yet. Well, those who are. Of those who have read it, uh, who, who is not in favour of it? No, in favour. In favour. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm putting on its head because obviously a lot of people haven't read it. Yes. So those that have read it. So the opposite question now. Those who have read it, who aren't in favour. I would just call on everybody, if you just mention, mention your neighbours. There's so much apathy in Wimbledon. People are busy, they've got families, they work long hours. There is so much apathy, and this is why the council gets away with so much. And you've got to be constantly on their backs. And it's, 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 it's raining, it's time consuming, it's wearing, but it's got to be done. If you care about Wimbledon, talk to your neighbours, encourage them to look at the proposals. If they've only got three minutes to spare, look at the video. And if it fills your heart with joy about the future of Wimbledon, that's great. But if it makes you feel physically sick, as it did to me, then that's, that's equally um, relevant. So just ask people to look at that video for three minutes and make their views known to So the sentiments of what you say, thank you. And that's exactly the right place to end. Uh, I really want everybody to get involved. Uh, and that's what tonight is about. And that's why I've chaired this for six years now, because I really believe uh, that everybody should get involved in their own local decision making. So two, two more items. Chris is going to give us a briefing on the uh, boundary review, um, which will be a, a, short, a short briefing. Yeah. Uh, and then after that, as you know, we have three reports every year where, where we ask um, our elected representatives to come and report to you uh, as to what's in their intro, what they're working on. We have a report uh, once a year from the leader of the council. We have a report once a year from the member of parliament. And this evening we have a report from our assembly member, the only Cooper, um, who will speak to us in a few moments and give her report as to what's in her intro, what she's working on, what her priorities are, and to listen to your feedback. Um, Paul, thanks so much for uh, what you uh, enjoyed this evening. And so Chris will just give us a briefing now on that. So uh, I will be quick. This is another consultation that's currently live, and therefore you can get involved and your say. Um, so you may remember that the uh, Local Government Boundary Commission, for instance, which is a, a separate government body from us, uh, came around and had a consultation last year about what the council boundaries should look like, the ward boundaries. They can't do anything about our uh, overall boundaries, so we're not going to take over bits of Wandsworth or Sutton or anything else. But what they were looking to do is try and equalise the size of wards to ensure that there's more or less the same number of electors to each councillor. Uh, so they went away and crunched the numbers. There were lots of submissions from uh, interested groups locally. And then this is the proposal they've put forward uh, for consultation. Uh, following this consultation, uh, they'll have a final proposal, which then goes up to Parliament uh, to be agreed and will be in place for the 2022 uh, local elections. So I'm zoomed in on the local area. This is what we currently have. Uh, the blue lines as well each wall. And this is what's going to propose the change. So there are quite big changes in the borough, uh, in this part of the borough, uh, the most noticeable of which is uh, Dundonald Wood Ward ceases to exist. Uh, again, mainly subsumed into a moved hillside ward. Trinity also moves uh, to the left as you're looking at that map, and a new ward is created on the far right hand side there, one ward, ward that sort of follows the line of the river there. Uh, but virtually all of the walls have some movement, uh, boundaries change, so if you are close to a boundary currently, you may find that you have moved into a new ward. Congratulations or commiserations, depending on your point of view. Uh, there are also changes to the number of councillors in some of these wards. Uh, so the new Wanda Ward will be a two-member uh, ward. Currently we only have three-member wards, uh, but we're going to have three two-member wards. Uh, 
uh, and they will be uh, Wandle, uh, Trinity, and Merton Park. Sorry, Hellside. Thank you, Mark. Hellside. So, um, uh, yeah, Hellside will be Tina and Ward, as well as Wandle, and Merton Park. So, those are the big changes. Uh, the consultation is running until the 2nd of March. Uh, so that's the link. Um, there should be documents somewhere in this building, but they keep the product and send them, but um, certainly this is the I've seen them. Uh, but probably online is easiest because then you can play with the maps and move them around and zoom in and stuff. So it, it, it's, it's quite interactive. You can work out what it was going on and then uh, submit your responses. Did you mention that? There's a bit of distribution up, it's actually going to have to know about the park. Yeah, Abbey Ward. Uh, It's not. So Abbey Ward sort of loses a chunk to Wandle and then subsumes a bit of what is currently Trinity. But I think, I think they said, but they were disputing Old Merton Park, which is the bit. Who's disputing? I'm sorry. But they were just not yeah. it yesterday, they were proposing that Old Merton Park be over to the New Merton Park within the whole side of the traffic. Sorry, I didn't hear that, sorry. So, um, you said that part of Donald, Donald went into Hillside? Yeah. It, it does, but part of it goes into Rains Park, and the other into, the, into a new sort of town centre. The railway's still in the way, so... So what, um, so what, what Chris has done is he's given us a, a, briefing, a briefing this evening, but it's not, it's not really for debate. Um, it, it's more to highlight the importance of... Do, can you just go back to where, where the consultation yeah. page is? It's really to highlight the importance of getting involved in the consultation. So definitely grab one of your councillors on the way out because we've all been bored to tears with it over the last few months. But, but this is more an information item. So, so please do go on and, uh, and participate in the consultation. Madam, I'm really sorry. I've just said that this is really we can't comment tonight. No, no, I'm, I'm asking for a point about the consultation. Which, does the consultation document explain, like, the criteria for determining a ward, like, you know, it needs to be homogenous or whatever, there has to be, like, a uniform character to it or, or something. So, yeah, the Boundary Commission my, website my will give a lot of that detail. And exactly what you've said, what yeah. makes a ward, why a ward, why boundaries are chosen, etc. So you'll, you'll get... You'll so get there's a lot of detail there's on there. There's a huge amount. And well, it, it, a bridge ward, it sets out the number of electors and the number of councillors that are put there. You won't be short of information. So it's, it's a 10-year review, so this will be for the next 10 years, and then we'll be subject to another review after that. No, it just seems I was quite shocked to learn this last time at my board. So, um, so the only you're very welcome. Thank you very much for coming to see us this evening. And uh, so the only is the assembly member for the whole of the borough, the whole of Merton. Um, so you're very welcome. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you. Um, I've brought some copies of our most recent report, which... Um, I'll leave them on the table so if people want to collect them more, I could sort of, I could have them around you to send them backwards from where you are if you want one. So you do, do, do keep them, but just pass them back to other ones. I wasn't sure how many people would be coming. I know it's quite well attended, so I have brought quite a few to try and make sure that and just take one and pass them backwards. Hopefully, you should be able to get them. Um, so I just remind you about what the role of the um, the assembly is and about the, the mayor. I mean, there's some detail in that uh, book that's just coming out, but we're a scrutiny body, and so we're there to uh, be the voice of Londoners so we can conduct individual scrutiny and also scrutiny through our committees on things that we think will be of interest to Londoners. And we can also hold the mayoral team to account for the pledges in the manifesto. Um, which came out in March 2016. Um, so some of uh, Sally's uh, manifesto habits are a little bit historical um, because it's been around for four years. Um, we're not part of the operational 
um, body in any sense. We're not part of the Great London Authority encompasses a number of things. Transport for London, the London Fire Brigade, the Metropolitan Police. There's a couple of development corporations, one that covers the old Olympic site, one that covers Old Oak Park Royal up in northwest London. Um, that sort of thing. Um, but we're there to hold the mayor's account to make sure that he's got a very large budget. In fact, we've just spent about six hours today in the chamber discussing the mayoral budget. Um, it's £18 billion. Pounds. Um, now, not so much of that comes from grants, as you might uh, expect. That's been reduced in a number of areas. For example, uh, London is now the only authority that has responsibility for highways that doesn't get any money from Highways England. Um, the money for the police was reduced, and I personally think this might have led to um, some uh, disagreements between uh, Boris Johnson and Theresa May. Just speculating there, but um, they sort of fell out over uh, water cannon, which he purchased um, to uh, bolster what he felt was the declining police numbers. So certain things are sort of long-term changes that have been going on that affect both um, the current mayor and previous <coughs> mayors. Um, in December 2018, we declared a climate emergency at City Hall, and a number of authorities, including Merton, have followed suit. And so we're pressing the mayor to sort of say, well, what does that mean? Making a declaration is meaningless. And I know that Merton is doing fantastic work on moving ahead since the July um, declaration was made, with a lot of people involved in moving that forward. And it's getting real action plans to actually see something through so that we can actually see, see a difference. Um, but, you know, the investigations through the committees, I was the chair of environment for the first two years, so 16 to 2018. Um, and then I had a year where I was only the deputy chair, which was felt um, slightly more relaxed. And when I was asked last year to, I would take up being the chair of the Economy Committee. And that's actually a very interesting committee, as you can imagine. Um, what with discussing the potential impact of Brexit, whether you're for Brexit or against it, it's obviously going to change our economic relationships with our nearest neighbours. Um, I wanted to do an investigation into the low carbon and circular economy, which speaks very strongly to the issues around making a declaration of climate change. But I'm asking the committee to look at what does that actually mean in terms of the jobs that you really need to see that through. And I'm very pleased actually to see that um, Helen is here from Love Wimbledon because one of the really nice things about being the chair of these committees is you get to choose your expert guests. And Helen knows where I'm going with this now. I'm afraid I dragged her to City Hall um, last month and she was one of the expert guests because we were having a discussion about keeping the high street alive. And the reason I wanted her is because I think Wimbledon is a really interesting case. Um, probably more the area at the bottom of the hill rather than the, uh, the village end. But, talking, but really, the home of Wimbledon is, is a very interesting it's, uh, case and how it's been kept alive. And the balance between smaller shops, larger shops, does it work in terms of the transport connections? These are all the things that we uh, took into our discussion. We had somebody there also from the Federation of Small Businesses, obviously looking at the small and medium enterprise on the high street, and also someone from the British Retail Consortium looking at the, the larger enterprises and what their role is on the high street. And they've been under a lot of pressure, actually. And they're talking about business rates versus online taxes and, and that sort of thing. So I have made a big contribution about you know, what is the value of the business improvement district and how that can really drive people into a specific area <coughs> and create a sense of place and a space where people want to come to. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing that the assembly does really well, um, as well as having the mayor's account today talking about the budget. And another thing that I think I'd just like to touch on, which I think came up quite a lot last time I was here, and I only got the end of your last discussion, but it may have also touched on that. Um, we are just about to finalise. It takes an awfully long time to go through the process. The uh, revised London plan, or the spatial development strategy, but thank goodness they now call it the London plan, because I think spatial development strategy is a fairly, it's one of the, and then it gets abbreviated to SDS, and then nobody knows what, what it's mm -hmm. about. So there was one brought in by the first mayor, and it took about three years to bring it in, and one brought in by the second mayor, and now the current mayor is finally, has been sort of going through the process of massive consultation. Um, and is going to be bringing in a new London plan. And it's very interesting. 
um, because it does talk about how to focus on the high street, but it also talks a lot about green infrastructure. There's a whole section of the plan where all of the policy sections start with GI, which stands for green infrastructure. Good growth is also talked about, but there's also the, the housing targets um, and also how do you put that together with the environment strategy and the transport strategy. So the London Plan, in one sense, is the overarching document that brings all those other mayoral strategies together. And we now just have the one environment strategy, rather than having separate strategies, as we did before. And I think it's quite interesting, um, the way that all of that has been put together. One thing that did come up in budget today was we asked some questions um, of the mayor, um, before we got on to the budget debate, about um, closure of police stations, um, and there's definitely no... Uh, this is something I've been picking up very regularly inside the building with um, <coughs> Sophie Linden, and I know that others in the room and a lot of people around the building have been concerned about this. There is no plan in uh, to close Wimbledon police station, so I, I might just as well mention that now as well. I'm very happy to take any questions, but I know we're getting very close to nine o'clock. I'll stop there just so that we have got a bit of time for some questions. Thank you, Thank you very much. So, questions, uh, comments? Um, When's the new London plan coming out? Because I know Mark Council had aspirations for Wimbledon to be a was it Metropolitan Centre? You know, like it was a business district, which in the draft London plan, it, that was it was not identified as a business district. When will we find out whether that has changed? So the process for becoming a business improvement district is going through the voting, and that does exist in Wimbledon. Um, because it's been posted on twice now, is that right? Yes, yeah, it has to be supported by local businesses. But the second issue about becoming a town centre, is it metropolitan? A metropolitan centre. A major urban area or metropolitan Yes, so it's in really the plan, there's a variety of different levels down to a local parade of shops, or there's a sort of an international shopping centre, which would be Oxford Street or Stratford, um, you know, something like that. Um, and Wimbledon presumably has been um, put into there in a certain place. Um, the plan is now at the point where we went through the examination in public last year between January and May, where there was a lot of people gathered in a room, about 25 people for each matter that the inspectors wanted to delve into in more detail. They have now produced their report saying what they thought about the draft London plan. The mayor has accepted a number of the recommendations, it made some adjustments as we went through the EIP um, examination public. The inspectors have come back with a few other things saying, we think you should re-examine the green belt, what about it? And the mayor said, no. Um, they've also said, we think you should think about fracking. Um, and the mayor has said, no. So there are a few recommendations that the mayor has just said, no, I'm not going to accept your ideas on this subject that I should rethink my opposition to building in the green belt or um, fracking. So it's big issues like that that are still under discussion, but the main document, most of the sort of layers in it around town centres, I don't think is, is so it's Merton, not that kind of thing that's happening. Merton's council's aspirations probably haven't been adopted by the mayor then. No, it's the other way around. Merton, so the, the London plan sits between the NPPF, the National Planning Policy Framework, <laughs> and then Merton has its own local planning policy framework with a series of documents. And the LPPO has to be in conformity with the London Plan. The London Plan is also supposed to be in conformity with the National Planning Policy Framework, which is where, it, it, once the inspectors have reported and the mayor has accepted most of their recommendations, it then goes back to the Secretary of State. And that's the point we're at at the moment. It's got to be agreed by the Secretary of State, at which point, because the National Planning Policy Framework is permissive towards fracking, that part of the draft London Plan might get overturned. So we're at a sort of point in the kind of the planning hierarchy. But Merton's plan and the Mayor's plan um, will have to be in conformity with each other. No, I think, I'm oh, sorry, my point was a bit different, maybe I haven't made it clear. Um, Merton Council responded to the draft plan, I think, and they had a different aspiration in terms of how Wimbledon was designated. Okay. And I, that, that was the point I was talking about. But obviously, Merton is very keen to make Wimbledon a big bit office area, a big business district, and it was linked to that. And I just wondered if the mayor had stuck with what his original proposal was, or if he'd be persuaded. I saw the deputy mayor for planning um, on Tuesday. 
I will put that point to him and I will find out the answer. I haven't, I must say, read the entire document because, you know, hands up, it's 800 pages long. It's extremely long. Unless you know, Stephen, what the final outcome was or anything know. I mean, they, they really are big documents and there's a lot of supplementary kind of guidance to go with it. But I, I can do that. If you give me your, I'm conscious that we're getting into a bit of a dialogue about one issue. I don't know if there's anything that anyone else wants to ask. <laughs> You said about all these things as manifesto players, and we knew I'm going to ask you. He promised that Londoners would not pay a penny more for the travel four years ago in his manifesto. You assured me that included my doing one the free travel cards. What have you done to come to that? So, actually, in the manifesto, it actually specifically said TFL fares, and the bit that has gone up in your one to three or one to six but you travel assured cards, me before I'm in a tweet, it. and I apologise to you the following week. So we've had this discussion before. There's nothing that can be done about it because that part of the travel card, when you travel around on the uh, transport system, includes um, network rail as well. I mean, I travelled uh, this evening from Waterloo on an overground train that is not run by Transport London. So it was my mistake. I misinterpreted something that I thought he had said, and I apologise to you. And I'm not apologising for that again because you've gone through that. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much. I've, uh, I was so delighted to hear that Wimbledon Station, uh, sorry, Wimbledon uh, Police Station, is not up for closure now. Is that, is that the same as saying it will remain open? Yes. I mean, one of the good things, and, and you know, I pay tribute because I know that a lot of people here have signed petitions, uh, you know, went out with petitions, got people to sign petitions, and did a lot of work um, to draw that to, to the attention of um, the, the Met. But with the increase in police, and there has been a promise that there were 1,369 new police officers as part of the 20,000 police officers that the um, Prime Minister has offered, although I have checked that and so far none of them have actually been recruited, but I'm you know, hoping that they're going to be arriving soon. But with that increase in police, it, it then becomes impossible to close some of the premises down because they actually need to, to go somewhere. So it's actually good for you know, that has actually worked and had a benefit in another way as well. That, that figure on the police in what area? 1,369 is the number of police that have been allocated out of the initial uh, figure for those that are going to be recruited. The 20,000 police officers are going to be recruited over five years. It's not 20,000 all at once. 1,369 will cover the whole of the Met. So how, how those will break down borough by borough I've asked Sally Benetton, and a number of other people have been sort of saying, and I was also a president, um, but so far we've not actually got a breakdown. If I hear how many specifically are going to come to the South West BCU, because don't forget, I can't say how many will come to Merton, because Merton is together with Wandsworth and then also with Kingston and Richmond. How many are coming to the South West BCU? I don't know. BCU basic command unit, because we, we've changed the way that we don't have 32 borough commanders anymore. We have 12 basic command unit commanders, and Sally Benatar is our local one. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? I have a comment. To go back to the assembly. Uh, yes, sir. Um. The mayor has been working hard on air quality, and yet he's approved the Silvertown Tunnel, which sort of smacks in the face of um, actually reducing pollution in London and beyond. Um, the London plan, I have a huge issue with the London plan because it talks about these massive amounts of houses that are expected from councils to produce. And there tends to be a discrepancy between what they can produce and the quality that they can produce versus the numbers they need to tick off in the boxes in order to comply with what the mayor has come up. So my, my point is... Um, it's not well thought out because it destroys neighbourhoods rather than builds up um, the, the, the sense of well-being in, in areas. It's just piling up, whether it's at, you know, horizontally or vertically, but it's piling up without looking at infrastructure. It doesn't give councils the guidance they need in order to develop their plans and design in a way that promotes well-being, which is what the mayor is all about. It's not just about say, you know, solving a housing crisis. Um, and I have real concerns that it's just figures on, on spreadsheets without actually looking at how it affects people's lives. So that's my comment. So I think, I think you raised, you know, probably, probably what is at the, I mean, when we're not talking about the situation with knife crime, um, 
we spend a lot of time thinking about how London is remaking itself. And I think someone was uh, putting on Twitter some pictures of what London looked like in 2008 or 2010. And if you look at it, it's completely different from how London looks now. And so this new London plan is an attempt to both balance the housing that we need, which has been assessed through the really light acronyms at City Hall. So they have a SHMA and a SHLA. And one is a strategic land assessment, and one is a strategic housing need assessment. Um, why we can't just have short words. Um, but it shows that there is a need. Now, the inspectors did not uh, agree that it shows a need of 66,000 dwellings per annum. They actually said, no, that's too many. We want less. And they also didn't like the size mix so much. And that's something that, um, you know, the, the assembly members, have been, particularly I'm on the housing committee, we've been pestering the mayor about this, um, like mad, because originally the plan was talking about an awful lot to be constructed in the outer London boroughs, a lot of one and two bedroom flats. And we weren't very convinced by this, because we feel that there is still a need for larger family accommodation. But there is still a, a need for a very large number of homes. So if you're going to be building a large number of homes, what do you need to do to make sure that you're then not destroying the... Because London, we all live in London, and we hear it being talked about by people who don't live here as if it's all one place, but of course it's not. You know, it's many different villages, and you can call Wimbledon Village literally Wimbledon Village, or you can go to Battersea, there's an area of Battersea that calls itself Battersea Village. But there's lots of other places, you know, down the road there's Mitcham, there's Morden, you know, there's Rains Park, but, you know, we know that everywhere has its own feel and is different, whereas people from outside sort of see it as some sort of huge uh, place that's undifferentiated. And I think the Mayor's planning team, because I've looked at the stuff that comes across my desk for Merton and Wandsworth that I see all the time, and they are starting to push things back much more if they're not keeping the green space, if they're not incorporating stuff that will mitigate against climate change. If there's too much parking for cars and not enough for bicycles, they are starting to challenge developers. And I think design and how you get a really good design panel, both at local authority and also at city hall level, and how you drive really good design is something they grapple with all the time in the planning team in city hall. So I think people are very aware of those contradictions and how do you how do you create places that will still be good for our well-being, meet housing need, but still places <coughs> that we really want to live in? And it, it's, a, it's a really difficult task. But they do grapple with it in City Hall, and I think they have done since the year 2000. And I'd rather have a strategic authority that's thinking about London as a whole than just having it all divided up into parts, which is what we had between 1986 and the year 2000. I think it is better that there's a strategic authority. Can I can I ask a follow-up if no one wants... Just, just one second, just see yeah. because we've got five minutes left. So is there anybody who hasn't yet asked a question or has a comment to make? Um, yeah, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, so we, uh, here in Wimbledon, we, we missed out on the um, bottom. We haven't had mm. a, a big old neighbourhood bid for a main one, in fact. So um, is, uh, is there any reason why a big old neighbourhood bid from uh, would not be the I mean, I think the only mini one that went ahead in the end was the, what, the, the major one in Walton Forest. Right, and, and, but not, I think, quite as extensive. I mean, it would be great to have here. I think the thing that would stop it would be money, let's be blunt. Um, and the, the sooner that Crossrail opens, the more likely it is that we're going to be able to start to look at things like this. But these are. City Hall is entertaining Liverpool neighbourhood bids. Mm. So the money's there. Yes. It's been, it's been allocated to Thoroughs. Two other the boroughs, this, yeah. This, my question is. But why, I don't see why, why you know, a, a bid can't go in that would be successful when another bidding round opens. Yeah, but I mean, obviously, yeah. it goes in rounds, doesn't it? Right. So, yeah. Okay, two more. What about the district line? Can you say who you are? Um, Dan Harvey, Councillor Hillside. Um, I use the district line every day. The Mayor has responsibility for TfL. In my opinion, the signals and the reliability of the district line has got worse over the last couple of years. Um, do you have any plans to get the Mayor to fix that? 
Well, the district line is supposed to be going through upgrading. Um, whether you're actually noticing that yet on the ground is a different question. Just as I've been pursuing the mayor over issues relating to tube noise at South Wimbledon, and I sometimes feel as I'm a hamster going around in a wheel because the rails get ground and the noise decreases for the people who live um, nearby, and then it all happens again. I will have another go at the mayor about the district line and when the full set of works is going to be finished. But I mean, it has been ongoing, unlike some of the other projects which have been sort of. Oh, okay. Not so much ones that are relative to us here. Are you going to be really quick? I'm concerned okay, really about peak hour rating when it comes to planning and development. Because the peak hour rating way you can build a high density close to good transport, such as a tube station, applies to every tube station, so from Morton to South Wimbledon to Collierswood and so on up the line, so that as you got the line, it's impossible to get on in the rush hour. Is there, going to, is there any way you can encourage a review of this peak hour rating? Say, well, let's encourage development not so close to the. the Do, does everybody all know what the peak tower rating is? No. The public transport um, accessibility level. But if the accessibility level is one, that probably means you're a very long way from a tube station and a bus route. And if it's six, it probably means that you're practically living above Wimbledon Station and you've got the tram, the overground, the underground, and you know, it's all very close to your house. Um, I would think probably not, because that's been in use for a long time. I think the main way to deal with overcrowding on the Northern Line, and I you know, use the Northern, Northern Line pretty much every day, um, will be Crossroad 2, which is the North-South one. Um, that's something that I have been regularly um, following up to find out what's going on. But that's one of those things that has to go through Parliament, and I don't know, they seem to have been busy talking about something else. Stephen's not here, so I can't tease him about uh, um, how can you tighten up the affordable housing quota? Because it's not applied across councils. And if there is a housing crisis, it's because people can't afford the houses rather than there not yeah. being enough houses to, for people to buy. Yeah, so it's, it's quite complicated the way that it's applied by City Hall, but essentially, if it's public land that has been owned by a council, or a hospital or something like that that's then or TFL itself and that's then being brought forward for development and the percentage of social rented housing on that that the mayor would expect um, will be much, much higher. So there's a minimum of 50%. On other sites, 35%. It cannot go any higher because of the way the grant funding system was revised in 20, since 2010. The way that housing, the grant funding has effectively gone for housing associations who've been doing most of the developments. So now if you want to rent something out that's social rented, um, there is some money obviously from, from the mayors, uh, but it has to be supplemented by people building some houses that they then sell, as well as borrowing. So some of the houses produced always on all sites have to be at higher levels of rent to cover any mortgage that you've taken out the borrowing. Um, and also the ones that you then sell that are not available for social renting. I've seen a couple of schemes where people have put something together where they've used money from the mayor and some borrowing from the housing association, and they have managed to do a couple of small schemes where it's been 100% at social renting levels, but that's really quite difficult to put together. Um, and that's just the way the funding system works. I'd be very happy to... Um, I argue that it should be operating in a different way. My background before I went to City Hall was working in social housing, so it has gone through many changes over the years, but currently that's the way the system works. So my question was, how do you apply it? How's it well, because there's, it's the mayor, not a... there's huge amounts of guidance that's been developed by the Deputy Mayor for Housing, but he's actually just gone into Parliament. Um, and it, it's hu hugely detailed, but there is also the possibility of negotiation. So there is, uh, but it will be no less than 35% and no less than 50% in general on most sites. As I, know, just I know everybody, I know it's very frustrating, but this is great space for us, but because the booking ends from the United somebody actually has to wait and lock up. So, we, so unfortunately we do need to wind up. Um, so, but, but thank you so much for coming to see us tonight. And thank, thank you very much for having me again. And, uh, and thank you everybody for your attendance this evening and have a good trip.